So thank you everyone for uh, coming today. Obviously, just as we said, I'm Alex Stewart. I'm a solutions engineer at Confluent. So we will come to the whole Kafka part later. But what we really want to share today is some of the learnings we've seen as a company that you know, practically exists because of that adoption of event-driven architectures. And like was just mentioned, I started as a 22-year-old uh, working on mainframes. There was a 30 under 30 list, but it definitely wasn't Forbes's, um, it was IBM's. And we were driven by data arrest. So I worked at a credit bureau, and every single night, every single week, a big chunk of data was brought from all of the banks, um, you know, all of the people loaning out money to people, ultimately to be processed against some um, simple static query. And sometimes EDA's heritage is actually very much driven by the challenges we saw. You know, that talk that was just on. Sometimes it's good to have those tight couplings. But when you have a big, chunky black mainframe sitting in a data center and that data is inaccessible, it would take months, years to build new applications. So reflecting on how those old databases, you know, they're still very much focused on dealing with these big problems where we may have an application that needs to answer a very specific query around a static question. But populating that, interacting with it, is typically going to be quite slow, um, potentially daily. And it's ultimately because in data at rest, we're being driven by the analysis coming to the data store. We're looking at the, the data, but not necessarily why the data change happened. And that's fundamentally driven by the shift that we've seen in the software world around us. If you think back to ordering a taxi 30 years ago, you probably called up a uh, a taxi rank, you ask them when a taxi would be available, I need to get to the cinema at 6 p.m., and they add it to a static data store. They can't develop particularly well off that. There's not a lot of enrichment, because they're only going to find out at the end of the day that a particular taxi driver was sitting around not doing anything between jobs. Compare that to your Uber or Lyft or equivalent today, where looking at the flow of data coming through, the events like traffic, like the availability of drivers, like the number of people trying to book, we're moving away from thinking like humans um, with our architectures and beginning to think more like software. So data has become really the center of our business. And really that's because software cares about events. Probably the first thing anyone here who's had to code in the past has written is Hello World, and Hello World is creating an event. It's a print line. And as we all know, events are just the things that are happening in our business. That could be from IoT sensors, it could be cybersecurity interactions in our network, or it could be more important things, it, healthcare records, customer interactions with our app. All of these events are presenting streams of data that model the operation of our organization. Each of these streams are events that we will publish once, like a human would, asking a question. But there are many other parts of an organization that are going to want to act on these, to process them, to understand what they actually mean. Ultimately, a data in motion platform is thinking about those streams, those sequences of events, and focusing on how we can act upon them, operate on them, and analyze all those events as they occur. Obviously, the act of doing this is stream processing, and the result is, is itself more events, coming back to that idea of where those couplings are. And in turn, those events can be consumed as well by other stream processes, or picked up by other technologies in our ecosystem, like microservices or databases. So, coincidentally, uh, very similar to one of the examples that was given upstairs, I think. We've probably all seen an event kind of process like this before. Pretty tightly coupled, where I'm going to my e-commerce website and I'm running a sales transaction. 
it's a pretty basic but technically event-oriented process. So my first event is my purchase request. Hopefully, I'm making sure there's actually some inventory there and not just shooting that into the ether. That's then going to produce an item reservation. And from there, account services are probably going to want to update to say that we want to take some funds away. My shipping team probably want to update to say that they're going to deliver this. So I have all of these services that see value from the same event. And of course, they themselves may produce events, so my logistics team may call out to a distributor or a delivery company to say, hey, we have 10 items, can we order a bigger truck? But we can look at these as events or alternately consider them more as events commands. So these commands are us asking to fulfill a service. And again, you probably saw something like this upstairs before. There's certain scenarios where it's pretty valuable just to have a broker that's handling those commands as they're passed back and forth. So a purchase request is handled by my purchase service that knows I need to issue a command to my inventory. But the risk here is how that broker in the middle is beginning to tie these together. So in a very API-driven world, for example, this can get complicated quite quickly. My inventory system is kind of a bottleneck that's limiting my account team from actually processing the next order because all of these are tied so closely together. And it's probably quite in line with Conway's law. So we're going to build systems that act the same way as our businesses traditionally were. That big credit bureau I used to work for definitely was slowed down because each business credit versus personal credit versus marketing off that data were very separate silos. And we see that on a more micro versus macro level here, where my accounts team probably don't care too much about my inventory as long as there's orders coming through. But when we conceptually move to an event-oriented approach, we start thinking in a very different manner. So when a purchase happens at time X, an event occurs. And I want this to be a record that persists, not just fired and forgotten, but something I can come back and reference if there was some audit reason. But perhaps more realistically, what happens if my inventory system crashes? The orders come through, and I don't want my accounting and logistics to be impacted by the inability to check that the app is running, for example. Because it's durably persisted, it doesn't matter. I can just replay from where that data was. And any process that needs to handle these events can then act on them and use them however they need. If they can't keep up with that service, the fact that they are more loosely coupled means that they won't crash or become overwhelmed. Instead, they can stay where they are in that backlog, catching up on that delta that they've missed out on. And we can even bring more services based on the knowledge of where they were up to. So maybe having a Kubernetes cluster that we can scale to play catch up in that scenario. We're not equally allocating and holding resources that are underutilized. We just have what we need when we need it to deal with the scale of the problems that we're trying to solve. So in the case of this event-driven approach, ultimately, we're taking advantage of that persistence to deal better with the scale of our events, but also the systems underneath. And we can't really know how fast those bottom processes, those bottom services, are going to do. And this is the other benefit of tearing apart um, the, the linking here by having that persistence, that I can begin to decouple my producers and my consumers. Because when we move to a model where we can asynchronously handle events, it's natural to move to that paradigm where the producers and consumers are decoupled. So the event producer's job is just to produce those events. It shouldn't need to know 
potentially, or care who receives them, with the exception of obvious security requirements um, and specific encryption, perhaps. But when the command pattern that my purchase process uh, needs to know what other services are being issued to it, I can move to this event-driven approach where as soon as I need to add a new service, maybe I have a fraud team who want to look at people who are pushing through new orders. I'm no longer tied to some central database that is now locked up because my logistics team and my notification team are querying that static resource. Instead, I have the scalability here to build out more, bring in more, and coordinate with other teams through that single backbone. So bringing that to the, the bigger picture here, in that modern architecture, one that is event-driven, we will use data at rest still, of course, but begin to take advantage of that data in motion, of those event streams. And combining them effectively is obviously very critical. So all of those event changes that accumulate a change in state, potentially even from a database, can be used to answer the big questions in our business, things that still require a daily, a weekly view. But the commands and the events that happen more widely can be spread to where they need to go as quickly as possible, whether that's an event-driven application, whether that's just streaming analytic services. And that means we can begin to look at problems differently as well. I mentioned security very briefly before. It's obviously great to look at weeks' worth of logs to find a hacker who's come in and interacted with our service. But what about if I run a bank and I'm looking at mobile applications? And actually, can I collect data from a mobile phone to figure out that this user is not touching their screen, but they do seem to be making transactions? Using window data here on those events may actually give me better insight to the interaction versus looking for specific security flags that I see along the way. And this provides a really nice segue to talking about Kafka and Confluent. So, probably goes without saying, you've seen us on the sponsor board. Confluent are here today because we are a company that was built around that need to move away from static data and look closer at events. Our founder was working at LinkedIn. I'm sure you've all used the recommendation engine on LinkedIn before. And coming to events like this, the last thing I want is to be recommended everyone I met at a customer yesterday. I want to add one of the folks in this room and then suddenly have it changed to say who else is working with them, who should I interact with? Because there is real-time, relatable information that we can process at a scale. There's hundreds of people here today, I think, where I need to process all of that going through to understand. And then, over the last 10 to 12 years, and eight odd years since Confluent was founded, Apache Kafka has ultimately become the backbone of many event-driven systems around the world. And we were talking about persistence uh, a short while ago. So for those who may not be familiar with Kafka and how it works, as the center point of many event-driven architectures, it's ultimately, and most importantly, an event record system. So using append-only logs, I'm able to write my data in a, a distributed manner that gives me the ability to, firstly, write incredibly fast. We have customers in the monitoring space who are writing tens of gigabytes a second of data to Kafka clusters, but equally have complete separation from my consumption as well. So we can see there on this consumer offset basis, I'm no longer locking up a table, blocking an API port. Instead, I'm, for each consumer, recording from my specific offset that I'm up to, while also being able to write to that same topic as well. So introducing massive parallelism, which is obviously critically important to an event-driven system as I increase its adoption across an organization. It's that persistence, that distribution, and that scalability that means we're no longer just working with a queue of events 
firing and forgetting as we pass requests between different services, but dealing with a true event store. And that can begin to allow us to think very differently about how we deploy our architecture, because ultimately, real-time and storage persistence can exist in the same system, so we can really begin to make that event data a first-class citizen. It's no longer a database and a message queue, the traditional Lambda architecture, where I then need to put a broker that becomes a bottleneck at the end, depending on what I want to consume. But actually using both those systems in a, a single point of contact in parallel, or what we call the Kappa architecture. Now, I'm sure there's some great uh, experts speaking today. Um, just listening to what was upstairs was already quite insightful. So one of the things we wanted to really pull out is where we've seen great principles that have been adopted for event-driven systems, especially using Kafka, of course, and using Confluent, and how we can actually apply those to make a, uh, a marked change in the processes that we build along the way. And one of the first of those comes back to a, a message that I just kind of talked about, which is how should we treat event data? There's always the risk with some of the older systems that people have used in this architecture, that the event is used, but it's still considered a second-class citizen. There's still a greater importance on the static data that may be sitting somewhere else. When you're building your first MVP, your simple deployment, that may not be such a concern. If I just need to get data from this database to this microservice, treating the function as the first-class citizen is probably going to be fine. But as I see wider adoption, as we spread out the business, as we begin to move towards having domains of event data, I have to lift up the value of that event itself. It's ultimately a, a bit of a rejection of the data warehouse or data lake or ETL process, because it moves some responsibility back to the services that I'm building and the teams who build them to actually find value themselves in the data product that they are exposing to the rest of the business. It's moving that onus to have a, a well-defined format, to have guarantees of what you're offering. And ultimately, event streams become an excellent opportunity to build out on this architecture. Because it means that even if my service is impacted, it's obviously already written to that persistent event layer that I am still exposing to the rest of the business. So if my microservice my Lambda function does fall down. Because I've already written to a Kafka topic in Confluent Cloud, for example, the fraud team are still able to consume up to the point that the data is written, despite my microservice maybe not being available. And event streams, like I said, form the very core of this architecture, enabling those systems to communicate. But they also give us some extra control around how we can provide discovery, how we can easily publish and consume this data, and ultimately build out those fundamental components for how we interact with our event streams. So to bring this back to our earlier example of our order system, we can begin to think about how we would actually change from that initial broker model in the middle to something where Alice and Joe, as owners of their specific domains, of their specific functions, can begin to renegotiate how they actually share their data. So we have Joe sitting down at the bottom there, and maybe Joe's starting to get some bad order data from Alice. You know, what should he do here? If we were just tying this together quite tightly with APIs, Joe may have a bit of a problem. Alice is going to have to ultimately tell him a, a quick fix, or even worse, if we have a, a data warehouse in the middle, we're probably going to have to change Alice's ETL process going in, and then whatever Joe is using to extract that data from my data warehouse as well. 
Joe may be able to actually change his ETL process, but the problem there is that's only really fixing the data for Joe. So my team in billing and recommendations are still going to be getting that bad data. So a much better approach here is actually for Alice to be responsible for those issues in the order domain so that everyone in the organization can benefit from the change. But we do need to make sure that Alice and Joe can communicate quickly on this, obviously in the classic people, process, and technology triangle. We need to make sure that we're following good CICD patterns, we have good communications in our organization to make sure that these teams can collaborate and work together properly. But Alice must also be a responsible data owner and be able to make such changes quickly so that her data continues to be good quality. And that ties in very well with the second rule. Hopefully, if you've been using uh, events up till now, whether that's over an API or something like Kafka, you've made sure that there is good quality, a format in that data that you're presenting. So schemas are really, really useful for this. In Confluence world, we support Avro and Protobuf and JSON. But more widely, in an event-driven architecture, having well-defined data is critical, especially as you scale from those early first MVP projects to having multiple lines of business interact around an event-driven architecture. Having comments and descriptors that can give people context of what this data actually is. Strong typing to make sure I don't end up um, having Alice break the inventory system by sending the wrong type of field inside her data. And having the ability to build classes and test cases around this to make sure everything's working properly are going to be critical steps along the way. And Confluence Schema Registry makes it really easy to integrate uh, with a wide number of serializers and deserializers across a number of different languages to handle this out the box. But one of the big drivers, of course, with event-driven architecture is that we are beginning to make our data much more exposed to a wider organization. We're tying in more services. Ultimately, we're changing and evolving faster. So as well as treating our data as a first-class citizen, we also need to think about how that data can begin to evolve. So just like a REST API, if we do need to make a change, we want to make sure that anyone using the old API isn't going to be affected. It's exactly the same using schemas with Kafka. And begin to consider what those demands could be as we change, understanding where we can potentially pull out things like default values or remove values along the way. So some examples there just to set a little context. If my business is expanding, we've had a really strong growth product using AWS managed services. We're going to spin up in EU uh, West 2 or something after successfully deploying an island. I may have to start adding a country code. So actually, should I begin to consider the backwards and forwards compatibility of my data so that downstream consumers aren't going to be impacted by this new uh, country code that I've added along the way. Or the flip side here, what happens if I have a, a user field that contains PII, and as I move into new markets, I may need to pull that data out. And that PII piece at the bottom comes to another concern that really is critical to building out as you expand an event-driven architecture. There will be breaking schema changes. It could be due to changes in the domains of data that you have. It could be that data was structured incorrectly when it was first built. Or there may just be ways that you decide to create uh, a new offering inside a domain that already exists to reflect changes in your environment. But we're a persistent data layer at Kafka, so how can we handle this? <laughs> 
Well, part of this comes back to actually knowing who is consuming our data, how is this data being interacted with, and skipping to those evolution points that we talked about before within our schemas. When data is a product, you also have to have that communication in place to make sure that the organization is aware and familiar with what these changes could be when they impact them. So are you going to let them know ahead of time, alert them as part of processes, or treat that data product like a real product and get feedback from those teams you interact with? This is definitely somewhere where we see um, customers who've moved to this architecture really shift how they're thinking, moving away, like I said earlier, with Conway's uh, law. Because you used to think in an old way of having silos, doesn't mean we have to now, otherwise we'll build an inefficient event-driven architecture. And just to show that quickly in context. So one of the ways I may want to actually approach this is how do I make this data more discoverable uh, to my colleagues so that they can understand what's going on. And that could be by using my schema here, so we're in Confluent Cloud. As I build out my schema, there may be a need to understand the history, but also begin to create some understanding of that data as it flows through. So I have a, a credit application uh, example here. And as we can see, I have my most recent version of my schema, but I may also have tagged some of that data as it's been produced. So for example, my customer ID here, I may want people to know that this is data that we don't necessarily want to share externally. And if I were to add a new field inside of here, perhaps region, by allowing my colleagues in the analytics part of the business, for example, to be able to go in and see where I've had those changes, they can know that their consumer on the other side is seeing changes in that data and build an application around it. And ultimately begin to communicate around those changes as they happen. But equally having that context that we'll come back to later to know that this is an integer or this is a string, so you can only perform certain actions on it. And having that extra metadata available as well. So this is private data, this shouldn't be exposed to a public app. Ultimately, making sure we have processes around how we govern that data. And that's where schemas do help us ensure that we are appropriately um, interacting with our data. So when I've added that new field, like we said, I can make sure that all of my consumers operate correctly. That's about the technology here of how do I make sure that we're checking those schemas along the way, but also negotiating with my data customers, making sure I can spin out that stream over time so that if there is anyone who's consuming the old data with a consumer that will break, that we maintain that persistence until they've caught up and consumed, and how to ultimately shut it down properly and eventually update our producer. And that relationship does come down to how do I create and empower a governing body in my business? If you're taking the Spotify model of having uh, tribes working on these products, then because we're taking a step away from maybe having a, a central data warehouse where all of this data is left and a data warehousing team who process it, actually having a data owner within that business can mean that we can begin to decentralize that data model and build around the applications themselves. It departs from a more traditional gatekeeper idea. We do still have our nice little SRE sitting and running our event streaming system, but their responsibility is to make sure that that data is available to everyone, not to be a gatekeeper that slows down the process of exposing that data to other bits of the organization. It comes back kind of again to the idea of aligning with how our business used to work and then understanding how as we change the architecture our, our very product runs on, how can we also change the processes and interpersonal interactions that happen around it. And some example of those decisions, um, I pulled a couple of these from speaking to a, a neobank recently 
who is making this transition across from one big central database to building their entire bank on an event-driven architecture, is thinking about how they are designing that data. Also going as far as looking at how it's monitored as well. How can I understand the relationship between the producers and consumers in my system? Considering access control, like was mentioned earlier, just because we are loosely coupled in the application sense doesn't mean we should be loosely coupled in our kind of data sense. We may want to make sure only certain individuals who have an agreed contract can actually consume that data. That obviously ties to our data policies, and then having our, our system of improvement over time. This should be as agile as creating your microservices is. So are there any data concerns in the business that we failed to address? Where have we seen problems in this particular setup? And dealing with those pain points allows you to build a much stronger product around those events that you build. And when that's been built out, this now means you can provide a much stronger self-service system for actually accessing that event data. You know, new applications may have to be in containers um, or have a certain way of interacting. Maybe all data is going to flow through Confluent Cloud or through another event service that you're using. But it's about building those paved roads so that you can understand what's happening along the way and having processes in place for building out POCs and just making it as easy as possible to reduce the toil and the overhead. And part of that, at the end of the day, will be how do I make this data easy to discover and to use for individuals? So again, I've probably been logged out once more. But in the example we have here, if I just jump back to my environment, I actually want everyone in my business to be able to understand what data we have and where it's flowing. So data governance can become just as important in my event-driven architecture as the event itself. So where I have here an example, if I just go up to the AWS example here, I have a credit application happening um, coming from a, a Lambda service. I have an old credit reporting agency database. I don't want to have 15 connections coming through from Equifax and Experian. I want one topic that everybody else can reference when they process this. It streamlines my way of interacting, and it means I can respond to that data change in real time without necessarily having to go through a broker. But if there is an issue in my credit applications, how can I go back and explore that data? And that's where taking this architecture here, where we have our Lambda and our SQL database, and we're then using uh, KSQL to process that information. You can see how where I have that source data, I filtered out the data that's relevant. We talked about that PII and sensitive data that I had before. So I can make sure that actually I end up only exposing data that's relevant to certain teams. So down here, I should have my um, approved loans in my credit business because I've been able to filter that data, create a data product that's actually relevant to my teams. And if there is an issue that happens when someone's trying to use this data, I understand tracing back maybe where there was an incorrect KSQL statement um, where I've added some persistence in the Kafka table you can see there to deal with the processing statefully along the way. And what this also means is, as you may be able to pick out, I have some connectors set up. So when I actually want to consume this data, it's in a way that's available to everyone. My legacy database that may have been hard to access before can now really quickly be plugged in because I'm using a Redshift connector and I've given my colleagues over in BI a, uh, access to that data through, ooh, I've been logged out of AWS, never mind. Um, access to that data via Redshift that they're then pushing through QuickSight. So now they can actually quickly see with a real-time update if that data is coming through, what is actually happening with our loans. So it looks like of our successful loans, the data that was actually relevant to them in this architecture 
We've been able to expose that to show, it looks like at the moment, tough housing market maybe. There's not many mortgages, but we are seeing a lot of personal loans and credit card usage. This has been exposed from the same data source uh, that we had sitting on the left, but filtered out and cleaned to be a relevant product to their domain, while still being discoverable and accessible through that Kafka view we had before. And as we covered there, that benefit of the historical data does mean recoverability is in there as well. Should I be a consumer? Should my BI team have an issue? They're no longer limited, having to wait to access that next monthly push or weekly push from my credit bureau. We pulled all that data out of the credit bureau's database. It's in a stream, and they can now reconsume and reprocess if there are mistakes along the way. That's really great these days, because disk is getting pretty cheap. But as we design a persistence layer for our events, we do have to consider where is that data stored, how long is it needed, are there tools like infinite storage and tiered storage with the Confluent offerings that allow me the ability to store this much longer in scenarios where that persistence is important? And like we said, KSQL can make it much easier to access that data. And again, those connectors, we shouldn't be rebuilding um, you know, Rome in a day here. We should be trying to find the repeatable pieces that already exist. So across all of AWS's streaming services as well, take advantage of those pre-built connectors. Take advantage of pieces in the open source community to have the repeatability and accelerate our adoption of that data to bring from those sources that may otherwise have been alienated previously just by the bottleneck that was created in their system. And perhaps the irony is that actually having this real-time data will ultimately allow you to empower those batch systems as well. It makes it significantly easier to expose the data if I have multiple batch systems that need to process it. And I can basically just invert the reality that a database is a change log telling me to do a certain CRUD statement. That is then an event that I can respond to and add to somewhere else. So a create in my database can also be a create sitting somewhere else in my data warehouse as I load it up along the way, but still something that can be used potentially by my microservices to kick off a process as well. So to close out there, Hopefully, you've picked up those titles along the way, but if you haven't, these are where we've really recognized the, the key principles for building event-driven systems. Those people who've been able to move from the, the early stage designs, the simple move away from what was to a simple event-driven project, to being able to actually expand an event-driven architecture across an organization. Um, so I think everyone's finished taking photos. So uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you, and we'll be opening the floor to questions. Great.